Thanks, Eric. Up next, we have a visiting medical student, uh, Paul Selid. He's visiting from the University of North Dakota School of Medicine. And he's going to talk about a topic today. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to some of our retina colleagues and a lot of residents alike. Uh, Avastin versus ILEA in exudative AMD. Uh, apparently more, more than anecdotal evidence. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jose, um, and good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about a research project that I did with a classmate of mine during our third year of medical school. And what we did is we looked at the two drugs, Avastin and Ilea, and how they are used in wet type or exudative age-related macular degeneration. But before I um, actually talk about the research project, I'd like to talk a little bit about the history and the progression of wet type age-related macular degeneration treatment, and then how this research project fits within <coughs> the existing data out there. And then I'd mainly like to focus on, within this project, the methods, results, and the discussion of, of how we're able to place this within the existing data. <coughs> so prior to the 1980s, my understanding is that the way we treated Wet type AMD was, we, we diagnosed it, we drew the lesion, and then there was not a lot that we could do for these patients. But in the 1980s, we developed something called laser photocoagulation that worked okay, but it never really improved vision, and it was only aimed at decreasing the progression of the choroidal neovascularization. In the 1990s, we developed something called photodynamic therapy with vertiporphyrin. That was probably a little bit better, but still not optimal. In 2004, we developed this drug called pegatinum, which is brand name Macugen, and that kind of, in some ways, probably revolutionized what we were doing in the wet type AMD treatment, and we've continued that over the next eight to nine, 10 years. So in 2004, I mentioned Macugen. That was kind of put on the map, I think, in part by this study in 2004 called the Vision Study, which showed that Macugen was better than sham injections and a placebo in improving visual acuity, or at least maintaining visual acuity. If we progress two years and we go to 2006, we get this anchor study which looked at a drug called ranibizumab, which brand name is Lucentis. And that showed that Lucentis was better at preserving or improving visual acuity compared to the previous gold standard, which is photodynamic therapy. So we kind of transitioned from the photodynamic therapy into the medical realm of treating wet type AMD where we did intravitreal injections of medications. So if we continue this, um, Lucentis came into the market and it's it's developed by this company called Genentech, which also made this drug called Bevacizumab. Bevacizumab has never received FDA approval to treat wet AMD. It was mainly designed as a drug to treat metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, and there are some creative ophthalmologists who decided that maybe this drug would actually work to treat wet AMD. So they've done that, and they started that, I think, in about 2005, and um, we continue to use it today. So another study that's kind of a sister study to the anchor study is called the Morena study, and that was in 2006, looked at Lucentis and said that Lucentis was better um, than placebo in treating uh, wet AMD. And then in 2010, plus some other studies in the British Medical Journal said that Avastin was better than photodynamic therapy or Macudrin, depending on whether it's occult or classic type choroidal neovascularization. So now we're kind of left, based on these studies with Avastin and Lucentis, and then in the years preceding, in 2011, November, we, devel <laughs> we developed this drug called Afliverzept, which is ILEA. So today we're left with Avastin, Lucentis, and ILEA mainly to treat wet AMD. So there's been a lot of research between these medications, especially Avastin and Lucentis. I list five uh, trials up there, but uh, there's many more, and they've looked at visual acuity outcomes in patients treated with Avastin, and treated with Lucentis, and they've said that they're basically equivalent in terms of visual acuity outcomes. Now, there's also been studies between Lucentis and ILEA, the VIEW studies in 2011, that I think helped bring ILEA FDA approval. But there's no studies that I know of, uh, at least since May of 2013, between Avastin and ILEA. Now, it's interesting because Avastin's a relatively cheap medication. I think the literature says it's about $50 per intravitreal injection, whereas Lucentis and ILEA are more like $1,800 or $1,900 per intravitreal injection. 
So when I was in North Dakota working in comprehensive ophthalmology care clinics, I'd see a lot of Avastin and a lot of ILE injections and some Lucentis, and I always wondered, why are you choosing which? And they would just say anecdotally, we think the ophthalmologist would say that ILEA might be a little bit better. And I took this opportunity to, during my third year of medical school, to look a little bit more into that. And that's what I'd like to present today. So this is a picture that I took uh, in Lake Sakakawea this summer. I, it's a reservoir of the Missouri River system in western North Dakota, and I did my best to grow up on this lake as a kid, water skiing, boating, and fishing. And just prior to coming to Salt Lake City, I caught this uh, walleye. It was about six and a half pounds, one of the bigger ones of the summer down there. So that's definitely one of the things I most enjoy. So actually, the research project, what we look to do is determine the outcomes of central retinal thickness and visual acuity in patients treated with Avastin, Oralia, and wet AMD. And we did this through a retrospective type cohort study at the Dakota Eye Institute, which is a comprehensive ophthalmology care clinic in Bismarck, North Dakota. And we looked at baseline central retinal thickness and visual acuities, and we looked at them three month intervals up to one year. And unfortunately, the injection sequence was not standardized because this was a retrospective type study. So there was 202 patients in this study, 111 fit into the Avastin arm and 91 fit into the ILE arm. We determined the baseline characteristics and then we looked at them at three month intervals up to one year. So we obtained our patients using the ICD-9 diagnosis for exudative AMD and they had to fit within this time period, uh, which led up to October 31st, 2012. Now that's kind of an important date for this study because that was the latest we could get IRB approval for this study. And that November 18th is when ILEA hit the market in 2011. So that left us with just under a year of follow-up time. So to get the power to make this happen was very difficult in the ILEA arm. We excluded eyes that were concurrent eyes or second eyes that had wet AMD so that we could have the number of patients equal to the number of eyes. Um, and then we excluded anybody who had permanent structural damage to the fovea like cystoid macular edema. And then just to be complete with statistical analyses, we talked about the 5%, that was consistent here. A p-value of less than or equal to 0 0.05 was considered significant. And I hope we did the right test there. Um, Baseline characteristics of our patients in each arm, we had, we looked at the age and most of the patients were in their 80s and most of them were female. We also looked at the baseline central retinal thickness, the log mar and the Snell and visual acuities. And in both of these categories, none of the values were, this, were different, which I think is important because we need to start with a cohort of patients and look at them through time when some received Avastin and some received ILEA. So the visual acuity outcome, we looked at these in terms of log MAR, which stands for mean angle of resolution. And you can see the lower the log MAR, the better the visual acuity. So we can see that especially uh, in the, the ILEA arm, we see a good result here at six months. It's, it's really able to improve visual acuity in the first six months. And we also see that for Avastin, but we lose that during the second half of the study. You can also look at this in terms of log mar gains of 0.3 or better, or log mar losses of 0.3 or better. Now this corresponds to essentially Snell and visual acuities doubling, so going from 2080 to 2040 or 2040 to 2020. So you can see at six months that our p-value shows we have a significant difference in visual acuity improvement of Avastin, of ILEA over Avastin, but we lose that at three, nine, and 12 months, and that may be due to the limited number of patients in the study, the limited number of power where we only had 18 patients in the ILEA arm at one year. We can also plot this in a scatter plot form where we look at log mar at baseline and log mar at six months, and then we plot these data, put a best fit line through there. And the way to read these glasses are these, these figures is if the line is less than one, it's consistent with an improvement in visual acuity, and both drugs showed a, a line of less than one where ILEA was better, lower than Avastin was. So a lot of studies will look at the clinical outcomes, the visual acuity outcomes, but we can also look at the anatomic outcomes, and we chose the parameter central retinal thickness. And we can see that ILEA was better at three, six, and nine months at decreasing intra and or subretinal fluid versus Avastin, but maybe due to lack of power, we lose that at 12 months. The mean number of injections, it would be great if we could have standardized the injection regimen to fit many of the studies where we give 
loading doses for three months and then we go every month, every six weeks or every eight weeks, but we had to look at what these ophthalmologists had done. And in one year they'd given over just over five injections to the Avastin patients and over six inject injections to the ILEA patients. And none of them were statistically different. So in addition to fishing and being outdoors on the lake, I've really started to enjoy golfing. And while in Salt Lake, I've been able to golf a fair amount and I've really enjoyed it. So to discuss what's going on here, there have been previous studies that have looked at patients on Avastin and or Lucentis and received multiple injections. And then because they become refractory to Avastin and or Lucentis treatment, they'll sometimes switch them to ILEA. And what these studies have mainly found is that we're able to, in these patients, able to reduce the central retinal thickness, so anatomically improve them, but visual acuity really stays about the same. And these studies were done in 2013, and they're not a head-to-head -head study like we did, but they kind of intermix the two drugs. And, and the reason that they think patients may become refractory to Lucentis and or Avastin is because of some like tachyphylaxis or um, systemic immune uh, response or sometimes some intrinsic properties that ILEA theoretically has over Avastin and Lucentis, and that's a greater binding affinity to VEGF or binding to uh, VEGF B or placental growth factor, both of which uh, Lucentis and Avastin do not do. Now, the, the visual acuities that we attained were Snellen visual acuities. That's what the clinic in North Dakota used, and I think that's what a lot of the Moran clinics use. But when you're doing a research study, it's nice to use the early treatment diabetic retinopathy chart, or the ETDRS chart, which is described here on the left. But um, it's just a more reliable, my understanding is it's a more reliable means to detect visual acuities versus Snellen's. So ideally, we would have used that, that chart. So the limitations of the study, it's retrospective and there's a limited number of patients and it was not randomized, so it allowed for a selection bias. We used the Snellen visual acuities and there wasn't a standardized treatment protocol for the injection sequence. So I think ideally I would recommend doing a prospective randomized control trial where we could have a predetermined injection sequence, use the EDTRS chart, and maybe do a cost-effective analysis given the difference in prices for these medications. So in conclusion, Avastin and ILEA both improved visual acuity and central retinal thickness. ILEA was better at improving central retinal thickness versus Avastin at three, six, and nine months, and ILEA was better at improving visual acuity at six months versus Avastin. So I'm from Williston, North Dakota, which is uh, kind of the centerpiece for this oil boom that you may have heard about in North Dakota, and these are a couple of just the pumping units, which are the final, uh, the final piece after um, drilling. And this is Western North Dakota, the Badlands is what we call it, near Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And this is a place where I like to go biking and hiking and fishing, and there's some nice golf courses out in that region. So definitely one of the prettier places in North Dakota. So I have to thank Michael Junt. He's my classmate who's responsible for 50% of this work. Alicia Doxon, I've uh, I've been talking to her about coming to the Moran since January. I'm very thankful to be here. Doctors Petty, Mamelis, and Hoffman have all been very, very good at answering questions. I ask a lot of questions in clinic and surgery, and I've really appreciated uh, their input into my educational process, and definitely the residents, technicians, and medical students have also contributed too, so I thank you all. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Did a change from baseline in thickness, you would have no difference. 
Okay. It would not be statistically different. And it would be the same thing with visual acuity because the thicker retina also all about significant was this vision. You can change from the baseline of visual acuity and you would not see a statistical difference. That's a, that's, a, that's a common problem because of our mindset that 0.05 is the magic number. Mm -hmm. Mathematically, that 0 0.08, 6, and 0.5 is completely not. There is a, when you get close to infinity, rather than using the logarithm, you can use this change from the baseline. Fred, sure. I'll let you go through this and take it if you could. I'll do that. Thank it's, you. It's a fascinating area, and of course, the big battle on this whole VEGF suppression. I mean, the, the big issue right now is, is that when is VEGF suppression either totally ineffective, or as some people are thinking now, actually counterproductive, negative? That's, that's, a, that's a hot area that, that really needs a lot more work. And then now that we are coming in with different mechanisms where you can get continuous steady state suppression, is uh, what's, the, what's the boundaries, what's the effect of that? And there's some interesting information suggesting that, and, and VEGF is there for a reason. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a vascular uh, regulatory modulator and continually suppressing it uh, actually may be counterproductive in other very interesting ways. So it's, it's this whole story evolved from the fact that it's got a huge backbone for retina active generation to, to where it goes in its next level. I, I think we're going to see dramatic Thank you. Hi, Dr. Petty. Uh, to reference uh, Jim Kidman's question, uh, so most photos have not had an ophthalmic focus. I'm just curious, did you go through the mentor or did you come to all of this as you went along? I, I spent a lot of time. During my third year of school, I was placed in Bismarck, North Dakota, and the big ophthalmology place there is the Dakota Eye Institute. So Dr. Fortney is one of five ophthalmologists there. And I spent a lot of time in his clinic, and um, like I said, I recognized this Avastin versus Ilea kind of situation, and I, he was the one who helped me a lot, but Michael Junt and I talked our way through a lot of this. He's my classmate. But he was there for some of the questions, especially the OCT, central retinal thickness stuff. Yeah, I, I tried to convince Dr. Fortney for a prospective study, but obviously that wasn't going to happen as a third-year student. The, the drug companies know the odds are very good that they've spent a lot of time and effort and more likely than not show that they're not better. That's, that's the case for a lot of people. You invest $30 million and come out saying you're a competitor, but 60 bucks is no better than you. Sure. I understand that. It's very interesting. Thank you very much.